the Davidians continued their weapon collection, and eventually, someone took notice. That someone was Larry Gilbreth, who worked as the UPS delivery man to the compound. Larry made so many trips to the Branch Davidian compound that they became familiar faces to him. In order to access the property to make the deliveries, he had to go through a checkpoint, which was, of course, run by the Davidians. After some time, Larry became suspicious of the increasingly heavy packages he was delivering. One day, he discovered by accident that one of the packages contained grenades. Larry contacted authorities and soon after an investigation was launched. Larry hadn't been the only one in the small town to take note of the isolated group either. The Waco Tribune Herald published the first piece of a series about Koresh titled The Sinful Messiah, which went after Koresh and the group. The paper ran the first story, much to the detriment of the secret mission the ATF had brewing. So the next day, the authorities made their move, a move that would be questioned even up until now, a move I myself believe we should question. One day later, on February 28, 1993, five days after I was born, the ATF descended upon the Branch Davidians' property. Obviously, the hope was to catch them when they were least expecting anything, but the group had been tipped off to the ATF's intentions because of a news crew that had heard about the investigation and wanted in on the story. When the crew came across the mailman on the property, it revealed why it was there. Little did the crew know that the mailman was a member of the Branch Davidians, who then warned Koresh of the incoming ATF. Controversially, even the ATF learned from an undercover agent that the Davidians had been made aware of the mission. Some argue that the ATF should have called it off right then and there. But it didn't. Koresh's prophecies of preparing for a war would come true. Witnesses from both sides can't say for certain who fired first, but the shooting started almost instantly that day. And it didn't end until six Branch Davidians and four ATF agents died, and over 30 people, including Koresh, were injured. The unforeseen long-term result would be a 51-day siege and even more tragedy. The following day, the FBI took things into its own hands. Very quickly, it was able to negotiate the release of more than one dozen children. But Koresh's message was clear. He was not coming out, and neither was his family. The FBI closed in with tortuous tactics, an effort to get Koresh to budge. Temperatures at night reached freezing lows, so they cut electricity to the compound. Then the FBI used bright lights and loud noises to deprive the group of sleep. One noise was the crying sound of rabbits being killed. Still, nothing. By then, it seemed like this was about getting the remaining children out safely, but the exact opposite was about to happen. Finally, on April 19th, the FBI had had enough. It ramped up efforts with military vehicles and began driving tanks into the sides of the compound, which housed the remaining 80 or so inhabitants. It then began using tear gas for six whole hours. It's been reported that the FBI knew the adults had masks, but the children did not. The entire ordeal came to a head when smoke began coming out of a second story window. In no time, the entire the entire complex was engulfed in flames and smoke. 75 people, plus Koresh, died that day. Of the dead, Koresh, 11 of the adults, and five children were found shot to death amongst the remnants of the fire. Think about this. A religious group confronted by government officials turned into children dying horrific deaths deep in a bunker below their home as it went up in flames. These people burned alive. Why the fire started has never been confirmed. What we do know is that the government's overreach of power at the start of the siege and throughout continues to beg the question, why did any of this happen? Why didn't they halt the operation when they knew it was no longer confidential? And how did a fire begin so conveniently once the feds advanced? I don't know about you, but the Waco siege is not something I learned about in school, which I think is a total shame. This should be added to the list of topics that are implemented in grade school curriculum because it's a lesson in determining when the government goes too far. We're living in a time when critical thinking is not just discouraged, but prohibited. And the damage is that younger generations don't recognize government government overreach, even when it interrupts their day-to-day -day lives. In my honest opinion, I think the feds had no right to incite the Waco situation the way it did. Sure, the group was weird and there are still questions surrounding what went on behind the closed doors of the compound, but we have freedom of religion for a reason. Even when that religion is extra fringe, I'm of the belief that cults should be allowed to exist. It's an American right to believe the way you want to believe, so long as you are not harming anyone. I get that there are speculations about the group, but there are so many answers we don't have. And regardless, did it all have to go down in such a final way this is charlie kirk founder and ceo of turning point usa if you liked this video be sure to subscribe to our youtube channel at turning point usa